Good morning. Today is March 4th, and the subject of today is Europe right now. Now, Europe sometimes doesn't seem very exciting, right? They're those nice countries we take vacations at, but actually Europe at the moment is a hot topic. Now, why is it a hot topic? The obvious one is the war in the Ukraine. The maybe equally obvious one is uh, Trump's comments. Uh, so let me backtrack and maybe I can convince you that the Europe situation now is very serious and something we should pay attention to. Now you will recall that in the end of the Second World War, a structure was developed in Europe, uh, which eventually became a structure to uphold uh, peace in Europe and was also increasingly designed as you moved into the 50s to deal with Russia and the Cold War situation. And you will recall Europe pretty much became divided between East and West and institutions were built. Now, um, one of them, of course, is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which has 32 members these days. And by the way, they're not all uh, uh, European countries, right? The United States and Australia are part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, as are um, countries like Turkey, for example. And uh, the bottom line for the NATO has been, and it's a very important bottom line, that an attack on one would be an attack on all. Uh, and the automaticity of all of the European NATO members, all the European NATO members, uh, being willing and ready to respond to an attack on any one of them, have most analysts over the decades uh, conclude that this very much has helped the peace and has, in a sense, settled a particular issue. Now, I think I've mentioned before, oddly speaking, the one against all uh, has not been activated except once. And the once was after 9-11, where we were attacked and European countries immediately were in the ready to help out if necessary. It turned out that uh, this did these were two attacks and it didn't expand, but they certainly mobilized on behalf of the United States. And of course, uh, European countries are assuming that anything happened to any individual one of them, uh, they would, um, every other country would get involved. It is the case that each country in Europe is assessed a certain amount to keep NATO going. The, uh, the assessment is what well, has been 2% of their gross domestic product. And it is also true that some countries have not paid up. That is to say, they have contributed less than 1%. But I will get back to that in a minute because that's also not so clear. Um, and, um, you know, there are NATO ready forces in Europe. Uh, there are ready uh, uh, flight planes and, and tanks and ammunition and so forth held in various places in Europe. For example, when Rwanda happened and uh, some European planes and so forth were sent to deal with that genocide or at least attempted to, uh, some of the things that were mobilized were mobilized from Italy because Italy was the repository of a certain amount of types of arms and planes and so forth. In addition, each of the NATO countries has forces within its armed forces which could be assigned and are trained to uh, be activated uh, even if they're not all sitting in uh, ready in NATO um, uh, military facilities. So why all this background? This background is because President, ex-President Trump announced the other day 
that in the event that some country in Europe is not meeting its 2% criteria budget for NATO, that uh, Putin, is, that he, Trump, is happy for Putin to just go into that country. You can imagine the freak out about this in Europe, because from the American, Canadian, European perspective, if this were to happen, that is to say, Trump were to become president, and he will say to Putin, well, if you want to march into, um, I don't know, Moldova or Poland or any country, and if it happens to be a country that didn't pay its full 2% to NATO, that's okay. That's okay with U.S. policy. In other words, Trump's uh, announcement has completely freaked out Europe, and to some extent, uh, the current administration in the United States and Canada, about something like this possibly happening down happening down the road. Um, it has uh, mobilized uh, NATO as an administration. It has mobilized various European countries. And everybody thinks, by everybody, I mean heads of state and so forth, think that if this were to happen, that is to say, if um, Putin and Trump decided that some country didn't pay its full percent and Putin and the Russians would um, move in there, then in fact, we would have a world war. Because, and Putin then added fuel to the fire by saying, not only might I do this, but if anybody in Europe oversteps the boundaries, and I'll get to that in a minute, of getting involved or getting their troops involved in Ukraine, um, I might in fact use limited nuclear capacity. So both over the NATO argument as well as the uh, Ukrainian argument, both um, Trump and Putin have created a situation in Europe and in the United States and Canada of something that could be considered a freakout. Are we in the process of perhaps having a third world war? And, and or are we in the process of having a nuclear war? This is totally serious, folks. This is not sort of some minor policy issue. Now, for a moment, let me just deviate and say, what about the 2%? Of the um, 32 members of NATO, there are, in fact, a few countries who on the books have not paid their full 2% of their gross domestic product for, uh, uh, to, for the NATO contribution. Some countries have been negligent or have said that they can't afford it. Many of them are, you know, stepping up and increasingly trying to say, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out some way to do this. But even the 2% is in some senses not entirely real because many countries in Europe have made major contribution to production of arms, uh, sharing those arms with countries that need it, uh, for example, providing arms for the Ukraine, and furthermore, for example, uh, being very using huge national resources, for example, Poland and Germany, to accommodate large numbers of Ukrainian refugees. And they're in some senses saying, if you look at our budget and see how much we're contributing to you know, peace and tranquility and helping Europe, we're actually at the 2% or even more so. So the 2% in some senses is correct and everybody is aiming towards it, but it also uh, has some flaws in it that some countries need to be forgiven because they are in fact contributing a lot to the peace and security and helping the European situation, which is not obvious in their more narrow contribution to, uh, to, to NATO. So in some senses, Trump and Putin have upset the post-World War II structure and apple cart. And there is real reason to believe that this is very dangerous. Some European countries more than others are taking this terribly seriously. Uh, for example, the Balkan countries um, 
and uh, uh, countries like Estonia and so forth. Estonia, by the way, is maybe a tiny little country in economy, but they're paying 3% of their, uh, of their budget uh, towards NATO. Um, and the freak out about all of this has, of course, led for Finland, and now belatedly because uh, Orban and uh, prior to that, Turkey objected to Sweden joining. So Sweden that has a con been a country that has been terribly neutral in wanting to be neutral, uh, has decided that the situation is so dangerous that they're actually going to, to, going to uh, uh, join NATO. So the mem it's a NATO membership has increased from 30 to 32 as we speak because of the danger that people now perceive of A, um, the uh, a nuclear conflict on the continent of Europe, which would be a global conflict, right? The United States and Canada and so forth would get involved. And uh, B has unsettled the apple cart politically, not just in in international institutions in Europe, but domestically in any number in any number of countries. So that is number one. Number two, of course, is the Ukrainian war. And there, uh, there are also new developments that are also potentially very serious. One of them is that uh, Macron of France said the other day that, you know, maybe if enough arms don't get sent to the Ukraine and the United States continues to dilly-dally, and not provide the arms, and if Russia makes increasingly increased inroads in the Ukraine, and maybe uh, what should happen is that a country like France, even if it's not NATO, should send its own forces there. And from a Russian perspective, of course, that's equivalent for NATO sending forces there. And everybody got super alarmed at the idea that uh, at least one government, in, in this case France, would have the bright idea that an intervention on the part of either NATO or a European country or two uh, in the military sense of actually sending troops as compared to sending arms uh, could in fact also ignite it. So you have two flashpoints. One, the flashpoint that Trump created and then uh, Putin followed up. And the other flash point is that somebody like Macron, for a variety of reasons, is putting out there the, the possibility at least that one European country or another could send either its own troops, its national troops, or its, have its NATO troops deviated uh, to help the Ukraine. So the Ukraine situation, which is getting very bad, by all accounts, and to some extent is the, again making of the U.S. Congress, which has refused and sat and tread water on allocating the funds to quickly send the kind of arms that the Ukraine needs in order to hold its own in the Ukraine. So that's the apple cart number one, uh, number two. One is NATO per se. The other is Ukraine, and you can be forgiven if you were European to think in both cases, the U.S. in the case of a former president who might become president again, in the second case, a right-wing Congress, which refuses to step up to America, the needs and obligations of the United States, are both creating a very dangerous situation in Europe. Not to... Uh, underplay the fact that the U.S. popularity in Europe, which used to be very high, and they thought we were sol in solid alliance, is now also at risk because the leaders of quite a few European countries are now saying, boy, you certainly can't count on the U.S., either in terms of uh, those two issues, the NATO issue and the uh, possibility of Europe getting involved uh, with NATO. The third issue that I don't want to dwell on has to do with arms and arms increases. Uh, many of the countries, well, at least some of the countries in Europe, uh, France, Germany, 
uh, and uh, it's one your non-European country, namely Australia, I'll get to in a minute, are saying, you know, uh, if the United States can't get it together to quickly send arms, we should send arms. And the Germans have also said that. Now, the problem with that is that most of those countries don't have the capacity to produce some of the arms that um, those countries need. So even though they may pay for them and put orders in, many of the arms actually and the planes and the various hardware has to be produced by the United States uh, because it has this large production capacity uh, in arms production, plane production, and so forth. So when you read the news, or especially when you hear the news, and you will say, okay, well, uh, we're increasing the amount of arms we're willing to send to, ex to Ukraine, uh, it may very well be that the actual production can't happen as yet in those countries because the production happens in the U.S. because those countries don't have the capacity. So as we speak, countries like Germany, which has very low capacity to produce military hardware because it tried to be demilitar not very military after the Second World War, but there are other countries which have not which do not have robust arms industry. Um, the more robust arms industry in Europe are France and and uh, United Kingdom. Uh, are you know saying okay wherever we can get arms produced and buy them to get to the Ukrainians will do so, and as you can understand the mix of all of this also suggests a lag. That is to say, Ukraine says we needed them yesterday, and countries are saying yes, yes, we realize you need them, but it's going to take a while to get to get them to you. And then you would say, well, why can't the United States just go into its uh, reserves, its closet, so to speak? It must have a, res a, you know, a large repository of arms. They could be sent quickly. Well, to some extent, there's a little bit of that happening. But, to, but in another way, of course, we, the United States, can't you know, uh, open uh, or clean out our closet, so to speak, in case we have national needs, right? So even though we're willing to send some arms um, that are uh, in our, hold, our holding cabinets, uh, the truth of the matter is we can only do this on a very modest way. And of course, the Republican Congress is also, is also attacking it. So uh, those are two or three unnerving uh, circumstances that and that that has Europe very nervous. And the other thing that has Europe in the United States Europe, uh, nervous is, of course, the Middle East, where the Israeli Gaza situation and the dire straits of Gaza uh, are uh, have led both the governments and many of the uh, populations in European countries to say whatever the justification of Israel to do something in getting its hostages back and uh, trying to get rid of the uh, radical aspects of Hamas, uh, there is no justification to the violation of all the various post-World War II uh, human rights, genocide, uh, and whatnot, the whole infrastructure, post-World War II infrastructure, to safeguard the attacks on civilians and, and all the rest. As you know, Israel's response to that as well during World War uh, II, look at what the Allies did to Dresden, but I would like to remind you that because of Dresden and Tokyo and, and places in Japan and the attack against civilians uh, is what led to a huge infrastructure of international law, which most countries have signed on to, so that it shouldn't happen again. Because things that were happening in World War One and be, and Two, especially in World War Two, are now considered war crimes of various kinds, and human rights violations, and genocide, and all the rest. So this is making the European governments very nervous, and the populations are thinking that the U.S. support of Israel, which has been very strong, though it's getting slightly more critical, 
uh, once again separates Europe and its concerns from the United States, which is not a good thing for U.S. policy uh, in the middle and long term, because the U.S., of course, has benefited, even though it sometimes doesn't sound like that when politicians talk, from its post-World II Western alliance, right? It's very strong Western alliance. And here somebody pointed out to me, how can a place like Greece and Turkey be considered Western alliance? If you look at the map, they're not exactly in West Europe, but they have been since 1952, part of NATO and uh, the, the uh, Greece and and uh, and uh, Turkey. While in the case of Turkey, is not a member of the European Union, uh, Greece is. Um, it has still been a very active member of NATO. Uh, both in supplying arms, whether it's the Korean War and, uh, and personnel, whether it's the Korean War or or subsequently. So on the one hand, it is um, Trump's comment. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, comments and our unwillingness to step up to the plate because everything is being held up in Congress. On the other hand, it's Putin's response to Trump's uh, hospitable, you know, you, you want to invade a European country, go right ahead if they haven't paid their 2%. Um, and it's also a, a third or fourth or fifth, I've lost my count here, uh, it's also the immigration question, because not only are we not handling our immigration issues well, even though uh, the Republicans blame the uh, Democrats and uh, forget that the situation with immigration was a major mess while Republicans were in power. The immigration issue is, of course, also very serious in Europe. And I think Europeans' attitude is that, of course, they are on their own in terms of dealing with their own European immigration issues. But on the other hand, um, it would be helpful if there was a little kind of collective thinking about, on the one hand, uh, we all have immigration issues. On the other hand, one of the reasons we all in Europe, as well as in the United States, have immigration issues is because so many people feel hopeless wherever they are living uh, and want to enter, and we don't have very orderly uh, processes in place because the international law on asylum seeking is broken and is not working in most countries anymore, as are other post-World War immigration uh, international law, which is also in disarray. So while this, in some senses, looks more like just an American problem or just a European problem, it is, in fact, the problem of both. And some kind of discussion and modest uniformity of figuring out a system would be would be useful. Now, one of the things that's problematic in the US of why it's such a mess is that we don't have the infrastructure to process people properly. It takes years to process whether or not a person who got entry to the United States can in fact stay or does in fact have asylum rights and so forth and so on. So that our incapacity to manage the system and to have expertise and bureaucracy is, of course, a kind of a failure. Now, I deal with this immigration issue because there is a flip side to it, and that is almost all European countries and the United States and any Canada and Australia and New Zealand and so on and so forth, including non-Western countries like China, like Japan and so forth, have aging populations, Korea, which has been in the news recently, have aging populations and need populations coming from elsewhere where they're underemployed. OK, and that is a major it's not an, just an American issue. It is an issue of all the aging out countries of which more and more will join in this century. So the problem of how to handle the surplus of labor in some countries and the need for outside labor in other countries 
uh, that are aging out, that have they have need for population, is also an issue that has come to the fore uh, in this you know messy situation in Europe, in the United States, in other countries. And you would think that the United Nations could somehow make an inroads in this and could help or facilitate uh, the various UN agencies figuring out a global system, how to handle this better. And uh, But that has to do with the reduced capacity of very many UN agencies, which is a different subject in a different talk. But it also uh, means that um, other countries are looking at the U.S. and saying, you know, we don't see particular cooperation on the part of the U.S. because of Congress mainly, but when Trump was in power and if he's in power again, wanting to cooperate, right? This is true in trade of goods, but this is also true in trade of people which needs to take take place. So the disarray of American politics right now and the freak out about the second Trump administration is making circumstances which in and of themselves are bad, namely Putin and his expansionist ideas and his warlike posture in Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, but it's also, of course, the, the concern on the one hand about Trump coming power, but also the concern of the dysfunctionality of the American uh, Congress. Uh, and uh, I think if you were not living in the United States right now, you would look at us and say, it used to be that the US was a centerpiece of problem solving on not all issues, but many issues that were international, whether it's uh, you know the Middle East or whether it's elsewhere. And the US has not always uh, succeeded. It has had many failures, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Libya, and so forth. But still in all, the U.S. kind of uh, was in the middle as a powerful country that mostly could be counted on to be helpful. And at the moment, everybody in the world is looking at the U.S., its reduced influence, its reduced engagement, and are scratching their heads of what will happen. And I would like to end by saying the fact that so much uh, gains are made in various European countries by the right wing politically, uh, in France, for example, in Italy, although that's played itself out slightly better, uh, Maloney is not as right wing as the party from which she comes. But in many countries, other than, let's say, um, Poland, which moved to the left or center, rather away from the right wing, but uh, whether it's Holland, whether it's potential of France, uh, whether it's the current government of, of the UK, whether it's elections held in various countries, everybody is freaked out that the disarray that I've spent the last 30 minutes discussing is in fact, also, as well as the immigration issues, is in fact having an input on the domestic politics in the, in the various European countries. So it's not just the US and its disarray. It is also the US disarray is fostering concern and movements to the right, toleration of more authoritarian leaders. And that is something that the US and its disarray is contributing to. Um, on that note, I will end today, but perhaps we can revisit these questions because as I said, there are all kinds of problems around the world, but now there is a US, European, NATO, Europe, et cetera problem as well. And thank you very much for listening today.